Good morning, and welcome to another beautiful Sunday on which to worship God. I'm Pastor Kirian, and this is the First Presbyterian Church of Ithaca, and we welcome you here. Today is Sunday, June 28th, and it has been a long time now, hasn't it, since we last saw each other in person. How long, O oh Lord? Well, that's the beginning of Psalm 13 and our scripture passage for today. You'll hear it again later. But we all know that time is a gift. It's one of the great gifts that we have. Time to be with one another. Time to reflect. Time to watch our families and ourselves grow. Time changes the world. Time moves hearts. Time opens minds. And this now is our time in God's hands. God's time for our lives. So together, in glad thanksgiving, let us worship God.
all to worship. O oh God, we gather this morning to sing of your steadfast love. We sing with joy. We shout of, the, of your faithfulness to all generations. We shout with trust. We walk in the radiance of your countenance. We walk with delight. We work to bring your justice to all as we wait for your coming. We work and wait with hope. For you, O oh God, are faithful to your promises. When we come into the holy presence of God, our humanity is laid bare. When we stand in the living presence of truth, our own falsehood is revealed. Friends and fellow worshipers, let us acknowledge before God and one another who we are and ask forgiveness from God, who is both our final judge and first defense. Almighty God, we confess how hard it is to be your people. You have called us to be the church, to continue the mission of Jesus to our conflicted and confused world. Yet we acknowledge in this we have been more apathetic than active, more isolated than involved. In our dealings with others, we are more callous than compassionate, more obstinate than obedient, more legalistic than loving. Gracious Lord, have mercy upon us and forgive our sins. Remove the obstacles that prevent us from being your representatives in a broken world. Awaken our hearts to the promised gift of your indwelling, renewing spirit. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, take comfort in this promise as do I. Even those things that are hidden from memory or are too deep for words are not beyond God's forgiving love. God, who knows us completely, loves us without reservation, and bestows pardon and peace on us all. So hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. 
Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, also with you. Let us now extend a word of peace to one another. This morning, children, I wanted to retell a story that Jesus first told. It's one I think about a lot this time of year as my garden grows. It also reminds me of today's scripture, so I thought we might listen to it again. It goes like this. Once there was a boy who held a seed. It was a small seed. It could barely be seen in his hand. His friend asked him, What is that you have in your hand? A seed, he said with pride. A seed, his friend said, laughing. It looks like a speck of dust. You'd better watch that it doesn't fly away. The boy looked down at the seed in his hand. His friend wasn't wrong. It was very, very small. But, he thought to himself, everything starts small. I started small. The big white cloud above me started small. Even the trees behind me started small once upon a time. We just have to wait to see things grow. So, he planted the seed and watched for it to grow. Nothing happened right away. Some people might have gotten discouraged by that. It's easy to let that happen, especially when we want something and we are afraid of being disappointed and we have to wait a long time. We might want to play an instrument, but we might not be very good right at first. We might want to be rich and famous. Then again, we might not, but either way, it doesn't happen just like that. It takes time. It takes growing. Nothing important or good happens right away. All good things take time to grow. Nothing happened right away. His friend asked him, what are you doing watching that seed? You're just staring at the dust. Your whole life is going to fly away. But the boy looked down at the ground. He wanted to see his seed grow. It took about a week for the seedling to show. It finally poked up through the ground, tiny at first, slender, but getting taller. It started to put out leaves, but it was very slow. The clouds changed, the grass grew. All these things were nearly invisible. It all happened so slowly that the boy could hardly see it. Slowly, from that tiny seed, something quite big was growing. It put out branches. It sprang out with leaves. It had little flowers that came and went. It grew strong. One day, while the boy was watching, a bird flew by. She sat on a branch. Little boy, said the bird, is this your tree? It is God's tree, said the boy, but I am its friend. This is a beautiful tree, said the bird, and I am looking for a place to build my house. Could I build my house in its branches? 
"'I can't give you permission,' said the boy. "'But I think my friend would like that very much.' And the little bird built her nest and laid her eggs, which were very, very small. The boy's friend came by. He saw the tree and all its branches. He saw the bird and all her young, and the fruit and how good it looked, and the shade, and how sweet it was. What a tree, said the friend. I want a tree, too. How can I get a tree? The boy reached up to where a flower had been, and took a seed, and held it in his hand. You must start small, he said, because everything good starts small, and everything big takes time to grow. And the boy thought about all his dreams for his life, and all the good that hadn't happened yet, and all the time he had in which beautiful things might grow. And that's how I like to think about the parable of the mustard seed. Good morning, congregation. It is wonderful to be addressing you this morning as the Director of Christian Education here at the First Presbyterian Church of Ithaca. The Youth Ministry and Sunday School Committee, or also known as YMSS, has been working the past few months on how to better serve our families this summer. But one specific program that we're focusing on is the Vacation Bible School. And we would like to know how to better serve you during this time of physical distancing not social distancing, and move forward as we find our new normal. One way that we need your insight is by answering a one-question survey that the YMSS committee put together and emailed you on Thursday evening. It is about VBS, and if you and your families would come attend an in-person, physically distanced day camp where we would adhere to these protocols, the bullets on the side of this, that talk about how we would do daily screening with temperature and questions to ensure that people aren't sick coming in, that we would do strict cleaning and disinfecting of the bathrooms and any areas that we use, but also we're setting up outside in Dewitt Park to help us with that um, minimizing of the, the use of the church. It also would be the six feet guidelines that we would set up to follow. And we would be asking all volunteers to take a three hour training on COVID-19 through Coursera. Session will be meeting on Monday night on the 29th for their regular monthly meeting. And we would like to utilize this feedback to assist them on making their decision on whether we should host VBS as a community or not. In the next couple of weeks, we will also be addressing other ways that we can serve you if you're unable to attend a physical practice or a physical uh, camp of VBS. So please fill out your survey that you got in your email by Monday morning so we can share that with the session and you, if you have any questions, you can either email me at Suzanne at firstpresithica.org or call my cell phone at 712-212-4819. And you can also find this information on our website. So thank you for all of your support and I really look forward to hearing from you. 
Listen to the word that God has spoken. Listen to the word that God has spoken. Listen to the voice that begins as creation. Listen even if you don't The Thirteenth Psalm How long, O Lord, wilt thou forget me forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul, and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Yet I have trusted in thy steadfast love, and my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 13, and it begins with these four words. How long, O Lord? How long? A question we ask every day, in fact, probably several times a day. How long until the red light turns green? How long will I be on hold with customer service, which keeps reassuring me that my call is important to them? How long until the hot, humid weather breaks? Though how long will it be cold and gray is probably asked more often in these parts. Asking how long is asking how long do we have to wait? The word wait has the feel of something being imposed as though we don't have any choice. Many of you may have memories of telling a young child to wait. Just be patient, you say. It's not that long. It's good to learn to wait. Good things come to those who wait. All these things we tell our children, and you know how graciously they are received. Heavy sighs and eye rolls. These are not uncommon responses. And we as adults probably have the same response, though some of us have learned to hide it better. Maybe. <laughs> We don't like to wait. In this psalm, one of lament or supplication, the psalmist feels forgotten by God and fearful that death will come to the delight of the psalmist's enemies. But in a turn that is common to psalms of this type, the psalmist remembers God's faithfulness and is buoyed by the memory that God has not forgotten the psalmist ever before. So the psalmist decides to trust in the Lord's presence, and that all will be well. And I think this is a common experience when we are in distress and pray. There really is something about sharing our fears and doubts with God that leads to our feeling better. Our circumstances may not have changed. After all, prayers rarely take up so much time that great things can happen quickly. But there really is something to be pouring out such despair before God that leads to a feeling of hope. Even though the turmoil surrounding the person has not changed, the turmoil within has been calmed. My guess is that the psalmist was prompted to ask, how long, O Lord, for reasons greater than a long red light or becoming tired of cloudy weather. And today this question, how long, is on our hearts and minds and on our tongues for reasons of life and death. Of course we wonder how long we will need to wear masks and keep ourselves at a distance from each other as we find creative ways to get together. Picnics with folding chairs carefully placed at least six feet apart 
are better than having no contact at all, but we long to bump elbows as we pass the potato salad. And how long, O oh Lord, we wonder, will it be until we are able to gather for worship in the sanctuary without risking each other's health and to sing without sending the coronavirus to all the people in front of us? This period of waiting we understand, even if we are aching for it to come to an end. To quote us when we were all six, are we there yet? <laughs> the answer is no. For the sake of each other, the answer is no. But the other issue, of course, for which we plead how long, is that of when black lives will matter. How long, O oh Lord, until that day? Yes, we want justice for all who have had their rights and liberties and lives taken from them because of the color of their skin, their heritage, or any reason that has been used to justify some being valued as less than others. But today I want to focus on black lives and how long the children of God, who happen to be swathed in black skin, have had to wait to be seen and treated as people, living, breathing, loving people. It is so uncomfortable for me to speak of they and them, because that means there is an us also, an us and them, a them and us, a division where there is supposed to be unity. I don't like thinking of myself as separate from people I know and love and respect, but I am by virtue of my white skin. I don't like having to face that I am, however unwittingly, contributing to the ongoing structures that sustain racism as normal, unnoticed, part of everyday life. I didn't mean to, but I did, and I do. How long, O oh Lord, how long must they wait? How long will we wait until we all take the actions needed to end this wait? You see, in this case, unlike the long red light or the unpleasant weather, the answer to the question how long is in our control, it will take as long as it takes us to bring justice. Ever since the first of the enslaved West Africans arrived on this continent 401 years ago, our black sisters and brothers have been told to be patient. Wait. Change will come at an appropriate time and pace if you are but willing to wait and wait quietly. Psalms such as today's have even been used to prove the value and rightness of waiting. As I mentioned, the psalm follows a typical pattern. I call on you, Lord, because I am in great distress. Awful things are happening and you have abandoned me. Then there is a comment about how others have it better or are taking advantage of the person. And then the person has the awareness that they are wrong in accusing God of disappearing. The person's faith is restored because the Lord has always been a help in times of trouble in the past. All the psalmist had to do was to ask and wait. Today, however, waiting is not an option. To be a black person and wait is to risk death. To be a white person and wait is to be complicit in death. The protesters who are peacefully filling our streets, protesters spurred on by the righteous outrage of black people who cannot and should not wait any longer for justice are people who express the full range of the image of God as it is found in humanity. And their answer to the question how long is no longer. Any suggestion that we should wait just a little longer while our society has time to adjust comes from a position of privilege. I know the word privilege has become one which stirs up strong feelings. In this case, privilege refers not to wealth or of having had a fortunate life, but to whether or not a life has been made easier by the color of one's skin. Anyone with black skin, no matter how light or dark, has lived a life made harder by his or her skin color. And anyone with white skin has had the privilege of a life made easier by her or his skin color. 
And so when I say a suggestion or caution to wait before we make any big changes comes from a vantage of privilege, I mean that such a suggestion is not likely to be made by someone whose life is at risk. So what can we do? Jesus taught us this. To start with, listen to people, particularly people whose lives are different than our own. Jesus walked from town to village to city to town, meeting, eating with people, listening to people as he went. And while I know it is hard to meet people now, we can read about them. We can read books by people whose lives have been very different than our own and who have a different take on things because of this difference, the difference in our skin color. Listen to the different ways of thinking, of speaking, of being, of using the gifts God has given. We can also dare to have the awkward, uncomfortable, and difficult conversations with people in our COVID circles. It is not uncommon for people, and in this case I am referring to white people, to have lived together for 50 years and never to have talked about stereotypes, fears, and questions they have about the lives of black people. We can dare to start these conversations and commit to listening, listening to the other person, and listening to what it stirs up within us. This is taking an action. It is waiting no longer. It is a first step. And actually, the psalmist was taking an action, praying, calling on God, and in doing so, was moved from hopelessness to hope. And it too is a good thing for us to do. How long, O oh Lord, until I have the courage to speak when I see an injustice? Help me to speak today. How long, O oh Lord, until I look at the ways my skin color has given me privilege? Help me to know that today. How long, O oh Lord, until Black Lives Matter lead us to make it today? Amen. witness to God's grace in Jesus Christ. God's reconciling work in Jesus Christ and the mission of reconciliation to which God has called God's church are the heart of the gospel in any age. In each time and place there are particular problems and crises through which God calls the church to act. The church 
guided by the spirit, humbled by its own complicity, and instructed by all attainable knowledge, seeks to discern the will of God and learn how to obey in these concrete situations. God has created the peoples of the earth to be one universal family. In God's reconciling love, God overcomes the barriers between brothers and sisters and breaks down every form of discrimination based on racial or ethnic difference, real or imaginary. The church is called to bring all people to receive and uphold one another as persons in all relationships of life, in employment, housing, education, leisure, marriage, family, church, and the exercise of political rights. Therefore, the church labors for the abolition of all racial discrimination and ministers to those injured by it. Congregations, individuals, or groups of Christians who exclude, dominate, or patronize their fellow men, however subtly, resist the spirit of God and bring contempt on the faith which they profess. With an urgency born of this hope, the church applies itself to present tasks and strives for a better world. It does not identify limited progress with the kingdom of God on earth, nor does it despair in the face of disappointment and defeat. In steadfast hope, the church looks beyond all partial achievement to the final triumph of God. Let us pray. O God Most High, let our prayers rise before you as incense, the lifting of our hands as the evening sacrifice, an offering before you. Hear our prayer, O Lord, and let the cries of all be heard by you. For you, O Lord, we trust to receive with love all our prayers, though by the world scorned, though brought with anger and unrest, though sealed in grief, and wrapped in the question, Why? Around the earth are those who suffer. Behind smiling faces stand the purgatories of our wounded souls, the ways of the world we have absorbed and not let go. Yet we turn to others when we are in prayer, and this outward bent is the beginning of healing. O oh God, we pray. We pray for those at the edge of what they can handle, of loneliness and isolation, of stress and responsibility, of reduction and decreased potential, of financial fears and food insecurity. We pray for all those we will feed this Saturday next, as dishes are brought with love and care to the church Saturday morning we pray for those we feed. May they taste not just their food, but our love. God of the ages, to you our times are not so strange. Maybe our comfort was stranger, our sense that all was under control and managed. Your story has always told us that times can change in an instant. We pray for our own strength, that we may, as your people, be shapers of a future of justice, harbingers of peace, voices of reconciliation, fearless in the face of sacrificial love. Make us yours in heart, word, and deed. O oh God, heal your people. Be present with all who suffer, and lead us on, O God, Spirit, Christ, in a voice united as our prayer, which now we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. How long, O oh Lord, until Black Lives Matter? We know the answer must be no longer. They matter now. And we know we have been called to act to make this answer a reality, to make it the truth. So go out now with a desire to learn and with the courage to act, knowing God has given us the ability to learn and grow, that Jesus has shown us how to love our neighbors and that we are led by the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. Be not afraid. Amen. <laughs>